as as Patrick Swinson, our previous guest, said, uh, he said it's, his, it's Shakespeare's nastiest play. I could see why he would say that, because it is bloody. The body count in this thing is super high. Um, we have witches. We have dark, ominous uh, moments. We have ghosts, beheadings. Like all, I mean, it's it's uh, intense. Welcome, friends, to episode 217 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm writer Luke Elliott. And I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And this week we discuss William Shakespeare's 1606 play, Macbeth. Well, James, uh, we got a tall task ahead of us today. We are tackling a little writer known as Shakespeare, just the most famous and, I guess, widely regarded as the best uh, (laughs) writer in the English language um, (laughs) of all time. (laughs) And also he is the subject of many sort of conspiracy theories and, and just speculation because he, he lived so long ago. And um, a lot of the stuff that we're, we're talking about uh, I'll be talking about today with his biography is disputed. It's, I feel like this is something we're only able to scratch the surface of, but I'm going to, we're going to do our best. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm happy to be here. Happy to be doing this analyzing Macbeth and and Shakespeare, whether he came up with every single one of these ideas, I think it's pretty obvious that his stories are some of the most referenced in all of storytelling. And to go back through something like Macbeth has been a fun journey because I remembered the sort of cultural touchstone moments, uh, the three witches, that sort of thing. Okay. But like to go back through it and to see like, oh, this is directly people are directly referencing this from Macbeth often. Um, It's, you know, it's a good exercise. And I think it's, it's nice to sort of force yourself into a situation like this especially because it's not the easiest thing to read in it and like i think with our modern reading sensibilities i just fly through pages and um in this it's really not possible for me because i'm like wait what the (laughs) fuck was that and i'm going back and i'm having to like figure out the sort of metaphor within every single sentence and like the subtext of it so it, it was a lot of fun it's not a quick read even though it is a short it's his shortest tragedy Wow. Um, and yeah, which I think uh, is actually good for us because it's our first time tackling Shakespeare. So there wasn't this immense thing to read. It was only I, I so I downloaded a uh, audio performance of it, um, which I think might have been free on Audible. But don't quote me on that. Um, and then I had the ebook on my Kindle. And the way I experienced it was listening to it being performed, which I think really helps with context for like the emotion and messaging um, from like a character standpoint. So that really helped me in that regard. But then it actually also really helped to have it in front of me so I could see what was actually being said. I could highlight words on my Kindle and define them because oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of very archaic language that, uh, and not just that, also just like extremely... Uh, obscure <laughs> obscure and just like you know cool words that i didn't know um it, it's a mix of all of these things right and then yeah a bunch of stuff that we just don't use these days or was was very specific to like england at the time um or or this area in scotland um and so there's a lot of that i had to had to define before i could move on because i didn't know what was happening and what they were talking about and i had to like stop and figure out like what is this even about oh, okay um so that really helped me but I did have, um, you know, I was 1.0 speed, definitely not <laughs> increasing the speed at all on this. And then I was going back, constantly pausing, going back and listening to stuff again once I got the context, once I looked something up. Um, and because of that, it took me a lot longer than two and a half hours to get through uh, this play. But it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, something that was impossible to overcome. It just took a little while and it felt the most like I was back in high school uh, that I felt in a long time as far as like something like, I, I don't know we just don't read stuff like this these days um, those of us who are not like in academia it feels like 
but maybe we should because I found it really rewarding. And and like you said, like I was recognizing all of these references and stuff that, uh, you know, like now that I've read Macbeth, we'll talk about some of them. But I'm like, oh, I, I can see what this person was going for and this person was going for. This is a reference to this scene. Um, and then, yeah, of course, some of the some of the lines, some of the moments stood out to me. Um, but I have not actually read this entire play before. I've not seen it before. Um, for whatever reason, this was not one that we got into. Um, and I think I have some suspicions as to why, since it is very bloody and uh, quite dark. Um, and, and instead, in, in school, we, we tackled King Lear, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet. Um, I think those are the three of his tragedies I've actually read. Um, doesn't mean I remember them perfectly well, but... Oh, and uh, Othello. I've done Othello oh, as Othello, well. for sure. Mine, I, I never read um, King Lear. I never, but I, Hamlet, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, of course, and then Othello. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, but but not Macbeth. Uh, you think at least in school? Not in school, no. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I guess let's start with our general thoughts. Um, and I'm I'm curious to know what your experience was reading it. Like, like I just kind of described. How did you go about it? Yeah, so I found this really cool resource that was like what I was what I was doing is I had the physical copy and then I was reading a scene usually and then I would go from that scene and there are like Shakespeare translators online that I found where it's like translating it into, into something that you can see as more modern and in, into what you're expecting. So I I would read the scene, work my way through it, stop a lot, try to figure out the subtleties of what was going on but i have to be honest until i switched over to that translator i wasn't drilling down to the perfect reading of the story yeah well uh, let me stop you there I, I also don't know that there is perfect readings because it is highly interpretive especially right. because of how far away we are in time but a lot of a lot of those interpretations that we read that are widely considered kind of the accepted interpretation some people might um contest them in some ways because uh, we are so far removed in time, but then also his l- meaning is so layered. And one of the things that makes him amazing is just how interpretive and uh, profound a lot of his lines are and how people can just mull them over, over and over again, obviously. And you see that all the time. There's a reason he's a staple of <laughs> English literature. His works lend themselves to studying metaphor, studying you know alliteration, poetic language, all of these uh, sort of tools in the toolbox of writers, um, he employs all of them. And um, I think that, I mean, alone is one of the reasons why he's he's so renowned. Um, but then also his observations about life were universal and continue to be even hundreds of years later. And that's pretty amazing. Definitely. I mean, especially with this story, something like Ambition, you could yeah. see that carry through almost one-to-one nowadays oh i was thinking of modern day (laughs) corollaries to a lot of this stuff you know and that's one of the that's one of the magical things about these is that they can continue to have that i was drawing the comparison to modern day literary stuff that we've read there's these moments where within a narrative we're getting the goings on of the scene and we're getting some of that poetic prose but it's almost like in shakespeare it's like he's just taking all of those flowery metaphorical poetic moments and creating the entire narrative around that and i was reading a little bit about like uh iambic verse because i you know i was familiar of course because we learn about in school but it's you know a complicated subject i think if you really want to read into it and he messes with it in this story people of higher status speak in iambic verse and then he'll switch to something that's more what you and I would see as more modern sort of like narrative structure. You mean like, uh, yeah. So you're talking about the, the sort of free verse. Yeah, I didn't scan everything. I, I didn't I didn't really look into that exactly. But I do. I know what you're talking about. And um, when he has like the there's like a there's like a guy who opens the door. And like when he talks, he talks in a very different way than like the, the king and the, the generals have been the porter. Yeah. And then also the uh, notably the witches speak in rhyme when others don't and that gives them sort of a mythological feel uh and it you know it lends to their sort of weird ominous uh characterization and that they speak in these rhymes and riddles this might be a little bit of recency bias but i feel like after finishing this i was like i think this is my favorite shakespeare work that i've read because 
it's it's not overly complicated. The plot is, and especially for Macbeth, it's extremely driven pacing and plot progression. Yeah, and, and it's for relatively short. Yeah, and I, I mentioned to you off air, it sort of starts with like the heaviest chunks of of acts. And then as it goes through, we get shorter and shorter acts. And it feels like this like acceleration to the end, which I found to be really enjoyable. And I, I, overall, I just I really enjoy it. It's fairly simple of a story. You know, I think I don't think it's overly complicated, um, but the way that it's presented is and, and like not to mention, like we're genre people. We like that kind of stuff. So for there to be supernatural elements and witches and ghosts and and some of the ambiguity of it, of it, if any of it's real, if there are actually ghosts or if it's sort of just this like guilt that's hanging over some of these characters. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology going on here, right? And exploration of guilt and ambition and and yeah, the way those two things come together and the things people will do for status and then and, and then yeah, the you know, the idea of being haunted, um, whether literally or figuratively. Uh I, I agree. You know, I I really was taken with this play. I think part of it is reading it <laughs> where I'm at in life now in my 30s and with all the experience I have um, reading other things, I think that helps. And and, and in some ways, it's tough to ask young people to read something like this and get all the nuances of it. I know why we do it. And it's kind of like teaching people how to think. Um, And and so I I get the value in that. But I do wonder if, if we're putting a little bit too much emphasis on something like this for young people because... A lot of it's very difficult to appreciate. Um, and a story like this hits harder for me now than I think it would have if I had even read it, you know, back in high school. The idea behind it, though, is to expose them to set a bar and then to have them thinking about it. And as time goes on, revisit these stories. And uh, yeah, th- this is a whole topic I could I could get really into because I do think that one of the unfortunate side effects of that is that people can get turned off to literature and 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 poetry and a lot of stuff through Shakespeare because they start to think that it's all like this um and and you know I don't think we teach enough modern greats in high school but anyway <laughs> um back on this this play in particular it is uh as as Patrick Swinson our previous guest said uh he said it's his, it's Shakespeare's nastiest play I could see why he would say that because it is bloody the body count in this thing is super high. Um, we have witches. We have dark, ominous uh, moments. We have ghosts, beheadings. Like all, I mean, it's it's uh, intense. You also have, uh, you know, Lady Macbeth, who is quite a striking character. And I was reading like one of his most notable, um, w- you know, women characters. She's she's sort of villainous. That's that's sort of groundbreaking. And in many ways, this this play could be viewed as pretty groundbreaking for its time um and even though i was reading that some of it was sort of designed to appeal to i think king james the first i want to say i could get some of this stuff wrong but uh basically he had a patron who was the king of england (laughs) who would come to his plays and like sit in, in the audience and so he was like crafting these things in ways that were going to appeal to his artistic sensibilities, but then he also was like doing little bits of things to like please his audience. And well, his I patron. kept thinking about the fact that this story is Scottish in nature, yeah. and then there's obviously Shakespeare's English, yeah. and, and an English king is in the audience. <laughs> and there's moments where characters go to England for aid, and England yeah. is this beacon of help. And and like uh, I kept thinking about like the con- I want to know the historical context about like. A lot of the stuff surrounding Shakespeare writing this. You're totally time. right. So so uh, Macbeth, it was a real Scottish king. Uh, I didn't get a chance to read all about the real guy because I wanted to focus more on the play. But um, bit huge liberties were taken, obviously, and things were changed. Um, and one of the things that you're, you're right on about is that England was portrayed as being like so good. And yeah. like you go to England when you need someone who's just and 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 uh virtuous and you know scotland's dealing with all this like political turmoil and like skeeviness yeah. and backstabbing yeah, and greed stuff. and avarice yeah um and uh there's even a moment uh where in the direction the stage direction it's said that like a bunch of kings come walking out in a procession of ghosts and one of them is said to be carrying a mirror and i was like what the fuck is that and um 
people don't know for sure, but the theory is that the one who was carrying the mirror pointed it at the king in the audience. Oh, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it's a theory. I mean, mirrors, we talk about, uh, I think even last episode, you mentioned with Patrick on the idea of like an eye, the same kind of thing as mirrors. When you see mirrors in storytelling, it's like self-reflection and, and a lot of that kind of stuff. So I, I was trying to draw into that when I was... Right. Is it just pointing at the audience in general? Does that mean something? Like, it could be you. I don't know. Well, it's also being shown to... It's a vision shown by the witches to Macbeth. Right. And so, like, I thought maybe of, like, a mirror of Macbeth or, yeah, like, Yeah, like, I don't pointed know. back at Macbeth. That's that, that's kind of how I interpreted it at first. But then when I read that about it being the king in the audience, I thought that was pretty funny. Um Anyway, uh, uh, we have a lot to get into. I'm going to go through, we're going to go through each act. I'm going to give a little summary uh, for each act, and then we can talk about the specifics of what happened. But I think it's time to talk a little bit about Shakespeare the person. So first thing I want to say, from what I was reading, it's kind of a minority of scholars. However, they are well known um, and loud. And I have heard this theory put forth many times from different people. But basically, the theory is that Shakespeare didn't actually write these plays and that he the the idea of William Shakespeare was kind of a front given and behind him was perhaps someone else or perhaps a team of writers who, for whatever reason, felt they couldn't put their names on these plays. Maybe they were because of some of the subject matter or what have you. I've heard I have heard this before. There's a lot of different conspiracy theories about this. However, from all of the stuff I was able to do, and and people probably can disagree with this because I'm sure a lot of people love these theories, um, this is considered a fringe theory, and there is not a lot of great evidence for it, Um, not like direct physical evidence for it. Um, There's not a lot of evidence from this period in general, so it kind of opens itself up to it, but these theories didn't come up to a few hundred years ago, and so for centuries... It was widely accepted that Shakespeare wrote these plays and there was no doubt about any of it. Um, At at the time, there was no doubt of it. People talk about Shakespeare as a person. Um, So I I don't I can't go in and refute the points because I don't know them all. But I'm going to focus on Shakespeare as a person with the assumption that he is the one who wrote all these plays. Um, if you dislike that theory, that that's fine. I'm just I'm not going to get into all of that. I'm going to focus on it as if it is true. So. He was born in 1564 and died in 1616. Um, So at the age, I think, of 52. So, I mean, by modern standards, quite young. Um, He was a English playwright, poet, and actor, widely regarded as the greatest writer in the English language and the world's greatest dramatist. He is often called England's national poet and the Bard of Avon, or simply the Bard. His extant works, including collaborations, consist of 39 plays, 154 sonnets, three long narrative poems, and other verses, some of uncertain authorship. Um, His plays have been translated into every major living language and are performed more often than those of any other playwright. That was something I wanted to say, too, is after experiencing the story, I really want to see it performed now in a theater setting. It would be cool. I I would get a lot more out of watching Macbeth than I would any other play just because of going through this process. And I'm sure after watching the movie we're going to cover, um, I will, I'll know it better than any other, any other Shakespeare, uh, play I've ever, I've ever studied. So, uh, so he was born and raised in Stratford upon Avon, Warwickshire. Uh, at the age of 18, he married Anne Hathaway, not the actress, um, (laughs) with whom he had three children, Susanna and twins, Hamnet and Judith, uh, so not a lot is known about his life, uh, his early life. Um, and, and in fact, there are there is even a period um, from between 1585 and 1592, um, which is kind of, I think this is the period which are known as the lost years or like no one even knows what he did. Um, so there's a lot of blank spots sort of in his life and people don't really know. But um, he began a successful career in London as an actor, writer and part owner of a playing company called the Lord Chamberlain's Men, which became later known as the King's Men. Uh, which I thought was interesting because I think that's where King's Men, like the the movie, um, mm-hmm. I think that's well, kind of what graphic that's... graphic novel. Yeah, the yeah. movie and graphic novel. I think that's what it's referencing all the way back to the King's Men, uh, which was the name of his his uh, playing company. Um, so this is, this is going all the way back. People may, I don't know, maybe there's more, there's probably more behind King's Men. Maybe it meant something before that, but I thought that was a notable occurrence. 
Um, at the age of 49, around 1613, he appears to have retired to Stratford, where he died three years later. So, yeah, 49, he basically retired. Um, so all of this stuff was done when he was young, which is pretty amazing. Um, again, different time. Like, you were, you know, older. You considered an adult, young, you know, at a younger age, and, and life played out faster. People just didn't live as long. Um, but still, I mean, from modern, from modern, modern sensibilities, I'm pretty amazed by that. Um, there has been lots of speculation about the authenticity of his physical appearance, um, what his sexuality actually was, what his religious beliefs were actually, um, whether or not he even wrote the works that are attributed to him. So there's tons of conspiracy theories and, and sort of speculation about it. You know, it's interesting and I've read about some of it. Um, but as a lot of it's because he's, he's just not super known, um, one of the reasons for that was while he was critically praised at the time, he had his detractors. There were people who did not like him, uh, did not like his work. Um, and he was well regarded and he had a wealthy patron in the king. Um, but it wasn't until years after that he became widely regarded as great. And over the centuries, that sort of uh, reputation has just solidified obviously through the through the you know the years um but you know at the time it wasn't like everyone was like oh this is the greatest living playwright ever like that was not his reputation it was more like oh this guy's kind of an interesting upstart and in fact he was kind of considered um having come from humble beginnings and he was now doing all these plays um in a in a place and in a time where most of the other playwright playwrights were of noble birth and were from these like families that were well regarded, he was not. So he was considered as kind of uppity, like above, like reaching above his station to do all this stuff. And I think that you know uniquely positioned him to comment on a lot of the aristocracy and the you know all these like kings. He had all these stories about kings and leaders um, who were very human and very uh, given to tragedy because of their human foibles. Um, in a way that I maybe other people who are in nobility might not have viewed themselves that way. It, to me, it seems like an outsider. Um, and I think that's really cool. But um, some people have used this as fuel for the fire that it wasn't actually him writing these plays because he wouldn't have known about all this stuff. I don't know. Anyway, it's just a, just theories. But again, we're, we're focusing on it as if he is the one who wrote them. As I said before, he had uh, three children. Hamnet uh, died of unknown causes at the age of 11. So he had a, a son who died young. And um, my suspicion is that was quite a tragic event and probably plays into a lot of the darkness that we see in some of this. Um, you know, that's just pure speculation. But, I mean, if you lose your son at 11 years old, um, and who knows what, I mean, it could have been any number of things in that time. I don't know. I mean, there's lots of stuff about, like, his time in London and, like, the way he would give different different shows and stuff. But... I think that's maybe a little bit beyond the scope of the podcast. His plays were first published in uh, something called the First Folio of 1623. Um, and that is where a lot of the, the text we have comes from. Um, but this play in particular had been being performed for years before this. And a lot of people wonder if it was in some way abridged or condensed in its publication and um, was actually longer because it, it is weird when consider, when compared to all of the other tragedies he wrote for it to be as short as it is. And um, some of the side characters people think are flatter than typically you get from Shakespeare. A lot of his side characters are a little more uh, developed. And some of the people think that maybe that was because of this potential you know, condensing that could have occurred. So there is theories that maybe Macbeth, when performed originally, was actually a longer play. That's interesting to know. I mean, uh, we talked a little bit about how, you know, digging into Shakespeare is such a big task. And I think there's a good chance we're going to return to Shakespeare in the future on the podcast because there's so many of his works that have been adapted. Um, and this one, I think, has been has had a couple of adap adaptations recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the tragedy of Macbeth, and I think there was another one with Michael Fassbender. If I'm not yeah, mistaken, yeah, Fassbender. I think that would be a cool one to do as a bonus um, because I, I'd be interested to see a different take on it. Um, the sort of image that we've all seen, there's like a drawing mm -hmm. or a portrait of Shakespeare. Um, basically, that was another guy who knew him, 
from what I was reading, like kind of described him and wow. it was a description of him or something that an artist did. And then he looked at it and was like, yeah, that looks like him. Um, we all know how like police lineups end yeah. up with like the images, they, they, the sketch artists. Yeah. Some of them are amazing, but I mean like, you know, that could totally right. not even look anything like But him. yeah. So basically as far as it's known, he, he never commissioned an actual portrait where he like sat down on an artist sketched him. So, so it's more of just like a, yeah, like kind of like a, a police sketch of the guy. Um, and that's what's widely considered to be Shakespeare. So his face probably looked pretty different is my guess, but who knows? Um, yeah, there's a ton more about him that we could get into, but I think that's a good overview. Like you said, we'll probably circle back. Um, I do want to focus now more on Macbeth, um, because that's, that's our play we're talking about today. I think we talked about this in, in like a Neil Gaiman episode. I forget for what project, but the Scottish play as it's known, um, in the, in theater is considered to be unlucky. And because of that, particular saying the name Macbeth while in a theater is considered to be extremely unlucky. Um, and I was like, I wonder why that is. So I, I was, I was reading about that. Um, there has, there was prominent cases of misfortune befalling people who did productions of Macbeth. Um, and that is maybe fuels some of this, but obviously it could be just viewed as coincidence, especially a play that gets uh, put on a lot it's going to have a lot of opportunity to have some sort of misfortune befall it. It's a very popular play. Shakespeare was known for appealing to the masses. As much as we look at him today and go like, oh, this is very highfalutin. Um, but I mean, his his plays are filled with murder and like, you know, they're, they're uh, broadly appealing in their subject matter. So people who went to see them, it was exciting and it was different than maybe what else was being put on at the time. And anyway, all of that goes into still there's the superstition surrounding the name Macbeth being mentioned inside uh, a theater. Um, and so people instead call it the Scottish play or even McBee um, instead of saying the name out loud. Some people say the play itself used real spells uh, uh, from real witches in the text and that what we are reading when we read Macbeth is real spells. And that supposedly this angered witches who caused them to curse the play uh, for all time, which is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> if you're if if you don't believe in this sort of stuff, like I don't. Um, I mean, like I believe in it, right? By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Like that's obviously a witch's spell. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. There's there's so many good lines. I mean, that's also something that wicked, wicked this way comes. Like it's such a cool line. And I think there's a name of a Bradbury uh, novel with that. And like, I've just seen that reference so many times. So supposedly several methods exist to dispel the cursed, depending on the actor. One is uh, you immediately leave the building. The stage is in with each person who uttered the name, walk around it three times, spit over your left shoulder and say an obscenity, then wait to be invited back into the building. It's one way you can get rid of it. Um, another related practice is to spin around three times as fast as possible on the spot, sometimes accompanied by spitting over your shoulder and uttering a, an obscenity. Uh, another popular ritual is to leave the room, knock three times, be invited in, then quote a line from Hamlet, uh, or even a line from The Merchant of Venice, which is said to be a lucky play. Funny enough, uh, Sir Patrick Stewart uh, once said, if you have played the role of the Scottish Thane, then you are allowed to say the title at any time and anywhere. Awesome. Hey, I mean, 100% <laughs> correct if he says it. <laughs> yeah, I believe him. Uh, one of the most widely studied writers in the world, uh, I guess safe to say the most. I don't even need to couch it in any way. The most widely uh, you know, studied, interpreted. Um, so, so everything we're going to talk about today... Um, I'm sure can be sort of correct and incorrect, right? Yeah, it could be in, it could, it could be uh, interrogated by people who know better than me. So full caveats, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little bit intimidated. I was I was going into this. I was intimidated. You know, like it's yeah. It's I was like, I don't know how we're gonna do this. So like, ultimately, I came down to like, I'm not your English teacher. Um, I'm I'm it's just a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> It's not my job to teach you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that's what I, I thought you were getting at. Yeah, like I, I don't teach this every year. I'm not, I'm not super versed on this. Um, I just read it for a podcast, and I'm giving you my my takes on it and what I could, what I could quickly read about it. 
Um, but yeah, uh, there are better experts out there and you should <laughs> listen to them who know better than me. Um, however, we are going to do our, our thing with this, with this play. Uh, so I, if you're ready, I'm ready to get into it and we're going to go through each act. I'm going to read a paragraph of summary and then we can talk about what happens. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So act one on a bleak Scottish moorland, Macbeth and Banquo, two of King Duncan's generals discover three strange witches. The witches prophecy that Macbeth will be promoted twice to the Thane of Cawdor, a rank of the aristocracy bestowed by grateful kings, and King of Scotland. Banquo's descendants will also be king, but Banquo isn't promised any kingdom himself. The generals want to hear more, but the, quote, weird sisters disappear. Soon afterwards, King Duncan names Macbeth Thane of Cawdor as a reward for his success in recent battles. The promotion seems to support the prophecy. The king then proposes to make a brief bit visit that night to Macbeth's castle at Inverness. Lady Macbeth receives news from her husband about the prophecy and his new title. She vows to help him become king by whatever means are necessary. You know, we start out on the battlefield and we hear of Macbeth's sort of being this heroic valiant warrior yeah he's like he's like cutting people from i don't know somewhere to somewhere chopping people apart he killed some other uh scottish uh leader who was like uh i think rebellious um and a lot of you know this is kind of foreshadowing potentially um we're also setting the tone we're we're establishing this is going to be a bloody thing um and yeah, we, we hear about his prowess in battle. Apparently, he's quite the warrior. Yeah, and to establish him as this this hero, quote unquote hero, early on. And I assume a lot of stories of the time were about valiant heroes who could fight well. And so to have that character introduced early on, you're like, all right, I'm attaching to this character. I want to I want to you know be along with his journey and hope that he ends up well in the end. And uh, we pretty quickly get introduced to these witches and. <laughs> the conversation that Macbeth and uh, Banquo have after the witches leave is sort of like he's not listening to what Banquo's saying and he's just like in his own head about it and he he's thinking about like, oh, I, one day I might be king. Yeah. And he's like, what 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 was that they said about your sons being being king? Yeah. Exactly. And, he's, and if there's one thing we've learned from literature about witches, especially three witches together, is that they might be giving you half-truths. They might have their own ulterior motives. Maybe... Uh, Take it with a grain of salt. But yeah, I, I mean, I, like I said, I love that the, the witches come in so early and set like set up this story. And, and it, it does remind me, there's a few mentions of mythological um, beings. I think Neptune being one of them, mm -hmm. or was it was it uh, Poseidon? I think it was Neptune. Yeah, and it's mentioned in a line, I think. The right? idea of the fates, um, the three fates yeah. in Greek mythology, kind of this, this reminds me of that. Three witches, three... And they're they're sort of like have supernatural abilities and can see the future potentially and are are affecting how Macbeth sees the world. And I was thinking about the fact that if he didn't meet these these witches, he probably would have stayed on the straight and narrow. But this this like set him off. Yeah, I mean, they're you could you could look at them as like laying the seeds like they know what this knowledge is going to do to him. And are they is it is it revenge for something is it is it like do they disapprove of of him doing what he did and and so maybe they're getting revenge on him by by seeding this um i don't know he, they're mysterious figures right and they seem to have motives that we can't quite comprehend uh I, I i i agree i think they are set up to be similar to the fates um in in mythology um i love them i i love these witches they're they're one of the coolest characters um that i've seen from shakespeare immediately am like fascinated by everything they say um it reminds me of a lot of fantasy i've read where you're giving you're giving these these cryptic prophecies and now the pe people are like we're not equipped to know the future right so if you give pe someone an idea that they do know the future they're gonna it's gonna like break their brain <laughs> in some ways and we see that happening to Macbeth early here um it is interesting to note that banquo is not affected in the same way um, so he's sort of set up as a as a opposite to Macbeth in, in in many ways in the way that things play out for him. And they're good friends at this point. Too. Yeah. Like, so to see him sort of, to see them take two sides on it. Um, there's this idea of Macbeth not listening to the prophecies, or at least like hearing what he wants to hear. And as soon as he's given this prophecy, he 
thinks that he needs to do something in order for the prophecy to come true. Like he can't imagine a, a, a way that he becomes king without any intervention. So I think that's interesting to note as well. Like he could have just taken the prophecy and then just stood back and seen if it played out. But he felt like he had to take action in order for it to happen. The other thing that I that I observed here is that <laughs> he can't just be happy with this this news that he's going to be king. He immediately is like, I'm going to be king, but you're saying my my sons aren't going to going to become king after me. It's going to be a fruitless thing and and there's no point in any of it. Um and so now he's like going to try and and worry about you know, finding a way to ensure that his family continues to be king, which I I guess people were people are still obsessed with legacy, right? Um, and, and at this time, I guess it makes more sense. And if you're if you're a nobility, you're probably really obsessed with it. But still, I'm just like, just be happy, man. You're going to be king. In comparison to other kings we see throughout the story who are more about their subjects and he's more worried oh, yeah. about like himself and legacy. Yeah, it's all about personal gain and ambition. And then we got to talk about Lady Macbeth, right? So he comes home and he tells his wife of what happened. And she <laughs> she is like every bit as maybe even more greedy than him. Like she is like, Oh, this is happening. We're making sure this happens. And, uh, Oh, you said the King's coming to visit. I have an idea about what we can do here to make sure this happens. Um, and she is plotting from the jump to, to kill this King Duncan. Um, and she's ruthless. I, I was, I was kind of amazed. I assume in a, in a really refreshing way in comparison to other stories of the time, because she's becomes like, almost the antagonist of the story for a little bit like she's to call attention to something i wanted to talk about too the the way that she's like using macbeth's masculinity against him and stuff and she's saying like you know you're not strong enough to go through and do these things like you you need to you need we need to make sure that we kill this king and and uh you're not strong enough just like i forget the exact yeah and be, come on be a man basically what she's what she's saying <laughs> So the idea I wrote down toxic masculinity within the story and it, we see it throughout. I think uh, this is the first instance of it. But as it as it becomes more relevant, I'll bring it up again. Yeah. And I totally think masculinity is at the heart of this uh, play, especially, you know, from my modern vantage of it. But uh, I think even at the time, I think it's in the text. Um, she uses the implication of violence and uh, strength um, being tied to masculinity um, to sort of get manipulate her husband, get him to do what she wants, and she sort of equates like uh, his his doubts as being feminine and being weak. Mm-hmm. And um, well, she says like uh, when she knows the king is coming, she has the famous line where she says like "unsex me," yeah, as in like you know make me have more masculine traits in order to you know fight against it because fighting is a masculine trait yeah. in the sense of this story. Right, it doesn't hold up because it was written in the 1600s to what we're seeing it with sex specifically. But that's if taken if taken at face value. Like maybe Shakespeare is saying like all of this stuff is bad, <laughs> you know? Like <laughs> Well, yeah, and there's there there that is the counter that that is introduced later in the story, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um and and also can be used to manipulate um in what she she does here. Um and yeah, I, I think we need to get into act 2 when 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 the the blood really starts spilling. <laughs> all right, act 2. Macbeth returns to his castle, followed almost immediately by King Duncan. The Macbeths plot together to kill Duncan and wait until everyone is asleep. At the appointed time, Lady Macbeth gives the guards drugged wine so Macbeth can enter and kill the king. He regrets this almost immediately, but his wife reassures him. She leaves the bloody daggers by the dead king just before Macduff, a nobleman, arrives. When Macduff discovers the murder, Macbeth kills the drunken guards in a show of rage and retribution. Duncan's sons, Malcolm and Donalbane, flee, fearing for their own lives, but they are nevertheless blamed for the murder. So, uh, murder most foul takes place here in Act 2. We got uh, a killing of a sleeping king. I think they even say they slit his throat open wide. Um, Blood all over the place. Macbeth comes out of the other room carrying these bloody daggers um and and lady macbeth's like what are you doing you're supposed to put those next to the to the guards to sort of um frame them and he's like i i you know i i i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't do that and she's like give them to me i'll do it so she he basically gives her the daggers and she goes off in the other room and is very complicit in what happens right 
Um, but then, yeah, we get this, we get these really interesting exchanges where he's like, I don't know if this blood's going to wash off of me. It could fill the whole, it could turn the, you know, the ocean in Carnadine or whatever. He's going to turn it red. Um, and she, she says, you know, oh, it's, but a small thing, a little bit of water and it'll wash right away. Um, which is, you know, foreshadowing, uh, uh what's going to happen later with her where she is sort of paranoid and, and trying to wash her hands uh, of, you know, a spot and she can't get it off. And, you know, the implication being that maybe this is something that's going on in her head. So she's wrong here. Um, but she's, she's quite, uh, convincing, I guess, to Macbeth. Yeah. She's like adamant that nothing's going to, the, 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 as soon as they become king and queen, that everything will be better. Yeah. And the, the little water clears us of this deed, uh, you know, of course is like heavy foreshadowing that I picked up on. <laughs> and, uh, interestingly the murder itself is kind of off screen yeah you know it's like the and i think it's because if you think of like a play you leave something like that to the to the imagination it's going to be more violent more bloody more everything else than if you showed it yeah in that setting Apparently this happens a lot in his plays where like something something is just off screen and the characters are sort of walking out of the room where something just occurred and we're seeing them reacting to it and multiple times in this story too yeah um, so then this Macduff character arrives, um, who, who is, is definitely, uh, the foil for, uh, uh, Macbeth here in, in that he's the one who starts to suspect him. He's the one who first discovers the murder and, uh, Macbeth is like, oh yeah, in a rage, I killed all of the people responsible. Um, I couldn't be contained. Um, and which I think is immediately a little bit suspicious, um, because we can't confirm what happened. The sons flee, so it looks like suspicious on them, but they're fleeing because they're like, whoever killed our father is probably going to come after us next, and we need to we need to get out of here. There's, like, weird stuff going on in the background, too. Like, we get, we get this Ross character um, talking about how the king's horses ate each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of, like, uh, the storms, the unnatural storms. Storms are brewing. Yeah, it's really ominous, and there's, like, weird shit happening in the countryside. So Supernatural, really. Yeah, supernatural. And that that's all, I think, tied to the chaos going on within the country, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Macbeth, uh, he, they, I think at one point the guards try and ask him to, to say their prayers with him, and he, like, can't say amen. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's like, you know, so, so the implication that he's done something unholy here, um, whether or not actually, or just his guilt, I think is open to interpretation. So you, you've mentioned a couple of times, and I want to talk about this Macbeth as the protagonist of this story. Um, and, and in the sense that we get his point of view, most we, we get him giving soliloquies a lot. Um, he, he sort of is, but he is also the antagonist of the story because he is also clearly the villain as things pr play out. He's done the, the most horrific things and um, his fall becomes sort of the, the thing we all know is coming and, um, and, and uh, we're waiting for. And it, 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 within the story, it's also the most dynamic thing, right? Like the, the, the he has to get his comeuppance. This is this is sort of groundbreaking at the time, from what I understood, to have the protagonist also be an antagonist. And I feel like we see this a lot in a lot of modern, like darker, grittier stories, right? Where like the hero becomes the villain. Thinking about Breaking Bad, um, a lot of people said that that was kind of a Shakespearean thing. Um, and and you see that here, like he he at first he's this like capable warrior out there on the battlefield doing cool shit, and then like. And he has he has reservations about doing the doing the deed, um, but then once he's done it, he starts to commit and he starts to double down. Um, he's still maybe uh, haunted by guilt, but but he, as as it goes on, he seems more and more like this is my lot now. This is what I've done, and I'm going to live with the consequences, and becomes more villainous. I think as a result. It's up to the audience to decide when you're no longer on his side. Like when do you, when are you like oh is it after the first the, the death of the king where he goes in and kills him off screen, or is it when on screen we start to see him going after p anyone who would challenge his his rule? Yeah, I think the uh, if you don't turn on him when he kills the king, you're gonna you're gonna turn on him soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get right. into it. Uh, let's get into Act Three. So Macbeth becomes the king of Scotland but is plagued by feelings of insecurity. 
He remembers the prophecy that Banquo's descendants will inherit the throne and arranges for Banquo and his son Fleance to be killed. In the darkness, Banquo is murdered, but his son escapes the assassins. At his state banquet that night, Macbeth sees the ghost of Banquo and worries the courtiers with his mad response. Lady Macbeth dismisses the court and unsuccessfully tries to calm her husband. Okay, and that's what I was referring to. When he decides he's going to have Banquo and his son killed out of, like, paranoia, just of the chance that his sons are going to become king next, you're like, all right, all right, Macbeth, you've you've totally lost it now. Right. There's there's an extended sequence where, and this goes back to the masculine, toxic masculine or anything I was bringing up, where he, Macbeth uses what Lady Macbeth was using on him and telling these, like, would-be assassins that, like, they're less of men if they don't go after this person who's wronged them and tries to like rile them up basically in that sort of toxic masculine yeah, way like, where he's it, like you're not a man manliness is wielded against multiple people right like accusations of being a man and like come on step up and, and do this thing or your your manhood is in doubt and ultimately what that means a lot of times in the story is like violent go yeah, be violent go be violent exactly um and wow does that still uh does that still plague us to this day yeah. Right. Yes. Um, that's amazing. Right. This thing was written so long ago. And yet that part of it. Yeah, that totally holds up. People still being manipulated by accusations of, you know, something not being masculine or being masculine. Right. There's so many lines and we're not quoting a lot of direct lines. Um, we could. But I, I feel like, you know, us reading a lot of Shakespeare, maybe not the most interesting things to people. But I, I, every now and then I'd note a line like uh, Lady Macbeth says, what's done is done. And I was like. That's a line that, like, this, you know, Shakespeare's famous for, like, he invented a lot of cliches, right? Like, and they weren't cliches when he invented them. They just became so widely quoted that they became cliches. And I'm like, is that the beginning of this? Is that the first time someone said what's done is done? Potentially. Um, It potentially was. And what's crazy is I think she was saying it in response to something that Macbeth says earlier in the story, which is he's dealing with whether he should kill the king or not. And he's basically talking about, like, would, would it have just been on a battlefield it would be done Mm -hmm. like you would just do it and it'd be done and it would be so simple or something something like that i'm butchering it yeah but then she says in response later on now that it's done and it's over with she's calling back to that moment he was talking about that and she's saying what's done is done right and then you know that moment becomes incredibly famous and maybe that's the beginning (laughs) of it yeah it's so cool um the whole stuff with the ghosts, right? Like this is this is this is cool. Like this is uh, Shakespeare loves to have ghosts. Apparently, I like that that we see Macbeth. See, he sees this ghost in his chair, and he like flips out. And he's talking to him, and he's kind of admitting things that he shouldn't be admitting. And he's freaking out, and then like clearly no one else can see the ghost. And so Lady Macbeth's trying to play it off. Oh, this is just something he does. Sometimes he talks to himself. Like, don't worry about it. This is supposed to be his big moment. And instead, it's 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 undercut by the guilt he feels. Now, is it is it is it a is it his guilt, or is it actually an apparition, um, or both? I don't think there's any reason for us to believe that there is no real ghost here because we've seen so many supernatural things occurring. Like, why why not have a ghost? Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, and I think it is both though. Like, it's kind of beside the point to try and figure out whether or not it's really happening. Like, it serves the same purpose either way. Right. And the bloody the the dagger as well that he sees. Oh, yeah. Fa- yeah. That famous one. Um, Ghostly dagger. Yeah. He says, uh, is this a dagger which I see before me? Um, and, and yeah, he sees this dagger pointed. Right. And, and it's this almost foreshadowing and, and prophecy itself of, of the violence he's going to commit. Self-fulfilling. In, in many and ways. it's and this is before he's killed the king. And it's sort of will he do it and it's a manifestation of his own mind potentially or is it a ghost tempting him to do it so yeah it's fun to like play with both of those things yeah and and you know honestly i think we're seeing him losing his mind here like he's going a bit mad um and it's fascinating to see lady Macbeth here is still she's still trying to rein him in and tell him it's going to be okay um and yet we quickly see her kind of switch positions with him and uh, we're going to see her start to become the one who is completely destroyed by guilt um, while he seems to rise above it. And I can see why people might look at this and think there might have been more to like the conversations between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth that for whatever reason didn't survive. Um, because some of that kind of takes place off off 
stage and 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 all of a sudden we just see her kind of changed and and people look at it and go like where is the where's the 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 scene where we see that change really take place um now i could be wrong about this which is just a blatant statement for about everything but like i kind of noticed that too it felt like she abruptly was no longer this ruthless woman who was power hungry and just just as just as brutal as her husband if not more so um she she changes and it felt like uh, I didn't know why exactly. And she it just kind of happens. Yeah, I, I totally felt that as well. But the way I justified it was she's like a microcosm of what Macbeth's ultimate journey is. Right. So like she because they switch roles, he is hesitant to do the murdering and she's adamant about it. And then they switch and he she is like, what have we done? And she's dealing with the guilt. And so is he. But he also puts on a strong face and like is a, in like in a way that I don't think he was able to before um, becomes the person who's saying like, you know, it is what it is. And he's sending he's you know, then he starts to get worse and worse. Whereas she they do the one she's involved with the one deed and then sort of flips and realizes the error of her ways in a sense and deals with the guilt. And it takes him sending other assassins and killing his friend and killing other people and yeah uh, when all these bodies start piling up maybe it's certain that i agree like the implication is that's what breaks her okay let's get into act four so macbeth seeks out the witches again who say that he will be safe until a local wood burnham wood marches into battle against him he also need not fear anyone born of woman they also prophesy that the scottish succession will still come from banquo's son Macbeth em- embarks on a reign of terror, slaughtering many, including all of Macduff's family. Macduff uh, had gone to seek Malcolm, one of Duncan's sons who fled, at the court of the English king. Malcolm is young and unsure of himself, but Macduff, pained with grief, persuades him to lead an army against Macbeth. So again, we see we see the witches uh, who who are having they're like communing with the goddess. Uh, Hecate, I don't know how to say her name, and they're talking with her, and she kind of like says like, I don't know why you you're doing this without my permission, but now that you're doing it, you know what? I'm gonna take over, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you how it should be done, um, and things kind of just get amped up even more. Um, Macbeth shows up, and he wants to know more, and they start like going, all right, here's come some apparitions to give you some more uh, prophecies. And 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 at first, there's a bloody child that 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 says to, said to rise. I was unclear if the if the child is supposed to be rising from the cauldron, or just like appearing. That's like one thing I couldn't quite interpret from the text and the performance I was listening to. But I'm imagining it could be it could probably be interpreted in different ways. But I, I was kind of picturing it rising out of this bubbling cauldron. Um, but maybe that's not what was happening. I don't know. But um, it's like a weird baby <laughs> that starts talking to him, um, giving him giving him prophecies. And then um, I think there's a bloody child. Um, I, I didn't write. What, what was the there's a there's a couple different things that show up to talk to him. I think it was a severed head. With severed an head. Armored yeah, that's one of them. And then there was the bloody child. Yeah, it was like a baby. And then there was like a young child. I think yes. we all talk to him. There was the people. procession that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And then there was also one more that I'm forgetting right now. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, and they're giving him all of these and, and, they're, and they're really trying to like they're driving him to do more violence ultimately. And he decides to kill uh, Macduff's entire family, which we see in this scene where uh, the lady Macduff is, is speaking with her son and like she she is already kind of pronouncing Macduff to be dead and her son's like I don't know that that's true and like here's the reasons why and they're having this conversation and then all of a sudden murderers show up <laughs> I remembered what it is now the child has the the branch in the hand that's like oh, signifying yeah. the wood about the wood happening yeah yeah which which it's so funny because like Macbeth takes a couple of like he hears about the wood thing he's like oh that'll never happen so I'm safe and then um the idea that he can he can't be killed by anyone not born of a woman and he's like all right, well, I'm safe then. That, that's that's nobody. Yeah, as everybody. So, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like uh, taking it at face value. Uh, no loopholes anyone could possibly think of for that. Um, anyway, um, so, yeah, then these murderers show up and brutally murder this Macduff's son in front of Lady Macduff, who runs off stage. I thought it was interesting. It's like, we'll kill the child, but then, like, the, the murder of the wife will happen off stage. Um but yeah, and then later we get uh, we get this messenger show up to Macduff and like he at first he doesn't want to tell him what really happened. Then the truth comes out and there was an important moment that you were talking about. He's talking with Malcolm and he's reacting to the death of his family 
and Malcolm is like, use it. You know, let's take revenge on Macbeth. Be a man and turn it into vengeance. And Macduff says something where he's like, I am being a man and I need to be a man by reacting to what just happened and feeling it. And I like that. It was like that, 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 um, the first time where we've seen manliness associated with like feeling grief and, and, and not immediately turning to violence. And it takes a great strength to overcome something like that. Yeah. So even within this, the context of the masculinity within the story, it's still strong and that's what people see as masculinity, but it is the, the, the counter to violence. Well, right? and, and stoicism in general, it was often tied with masculinity and like the idea that you just don't feel emotion, don't show emotion, don't right. express emotion to do that is to be not masculine. So I think in this moment for Macduff to say, no, what I'm going to feel this right. um, is important and it is a distinct way of, uh, of expressing his masculinity that's been different than everything else we've seen. Doesn't he also say something about like a king? Because he's talking to Malcolm and I think he says something about Macbeth is the tyrant at this point. Yeah. And they're talking about a king who is compassionate toward the subjects and comparing what masculinity could be within the context of like a king. And like you're seeing Macbeth, the violent, lashing out. And then there's also the kings that are, I think it may be even be in reference to this king the english king that they're with yeah no yeah he's a he's a good example willing to help and and uh compassionate for for other people's well well well-being and stuff yeah a lot of this is about setting malcolm up to be a more just ruler that we're going to be happy with in the long run um and there's this whole conversation where he's acting like he he's going to be a terrible king he's like oh you know i'm too lustful uh, yeah. You know, I, if you, you give me the power and, and uh, you know, basically it sounded like he was saying like he'll just be like chasing women constantly, um, but also just like lust for power, wanting to control more lands and all this stuff. And um, he's talking like this to Macduff, who's like, you know what? It doesn't sound like you're going to be a good king, actually. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do this. And then he's like, you pass the test. <laughs> Psych. <laughs> I was messing with you the whole time. And then he's like, oh, OK, good, because I was getting worried there for a minute. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, it was funny. It's like, that was the test. You know, you better, you better call me on this bullshit. Um, again, it's making us like Malcolm a little bit. Um, but I can see what people are saying that like, maybe some of these characters feel a little less ra- well-rounded. Like Macduff, I don't have like a great sense of who he is. Malcolm, even less so. And like the further away you get from Macbeth, the more flimsy some of these characters seem in my eyes. Like they serve their roles fine, but I don't have a great sense of like Iago from, from Othello as the antagonist. It's like, such a distinct character and like there's so many distinct characters in a lot of his other plays that I, I i'm not quite getting here now that leads leaves the door wide open i think for people who are adapting it to come in and like give distinct characteristics to each of these people and make them really stand out so. it, it does feel like in another shakespeare story they get more scenes these characters yeah. get more scenes to be built up all right act five Macbeth feels safe in his remote castle at Dunsinane until he is told that burnham wood is moving towards him Malcolm's army is carrying branches from the forest as camouflage for their assault on Macbeth's stronghold. Meanwhile, an overwrought and conscience-ridden Lady Macbeth walks in her sleep and tells her secrets to her doctor. She commits suicide. As the final battle commences, Macbeth hears Lady Macbeth's suicide and mourns. Okay, so that's obviously a very brief outline of, of what happens in this act. Let's talk about it. So we get the doctor and we get the Lady Macbeth is, is sleepwalking. And clearly she is overcome with guilt and she's like dreaming about her guilt. And it's interesting because we've got the doctor and someone else just like watching this occur um, and like hear her talking about shit she shouldn't be talking about. (laughs) And um, this is where she's washing her hands and she's trying to get that spot gone. um, And she can't. Out damn spot. Yes. That's what she says. Yeah. Great, great line. There's a couple lines and nearing the end, I'd like to read my favorite, um, my favorite quote from the whole from the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, please do. This guilt, to me, feels a little bit like it came out of nowhere. Now, Macbeth has done a lot of heinous shit, so the implication is she didn't approve of him like killing entire families and stuff. And but but she set him down a path. She did, and so she's feeling the guilt of that. We didn't get a scene where that sort of was laid out in front of us, but we see the effects of it here. Um, and 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 one thing I also thought was interesting was the idea that she committed suicide. Because all that happens is we hear like a woman scream off stage, 
and then we hear like a, some more sounds, I think. And then someone comes in from the other room and is like, Lady Macbeth is dead. I thought how it went down was Macbeth heard that she was sleepwalking and doing all these things. And then he told the doctor to go take care of it. Yeah. And then like, we don't know how the doctor took care of it. Yeah, that. I don't know. But everything I was reading was suicide. It was like, oh, yeah, Lady Macbeth's suicide. And I was like, okay, I, you know, I, it's, it's interesting because I wonder if there are theories that she was killed or that um, she accidentally died or was attacked or something. Because she's like screaming. Like, why is she screaming if she's committing suicide? Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Dramatic, I guess, if you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Scream. Um, but yeah, everything I was reading, Lady Macbeth committed suicide. Okay. Uh, that that you know, I'll I'll take people's word for it. <laughs> I assume they know better than me. Um, we get uh, we get a soliloquy kind of. He's actually talking to another character, but he he is also talking to the audience in a way that is usually considered a soliloquy um, from Macbeth, which um, is very famous, probably the most famous um, section um, yeah. from the entire play. I think this includes my favorite quote. So, probably. are you going to read a part of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fairly short one, so I'll just read it. I'm not I'm not you know. Forgive me, because I'm, I'm not an actor here. Macbeth, after he learns of his wife's death, says, She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Uh, which at least the end of that is something I've heard many times. Uh, this to me is all about life and how short it is and how we can only see so far how you know our all our yesterdays have lighted fools uh this way to dusty death um i don't know there's just a lot to take apart here and to read into it i think it's a it's a great section and um of course the uh the poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more this is also a little bit fourth wall breaking right like he's we're we're watching a performance and an actor give this speech and he's talking about being an actor on a stage and um it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing is he talking about the very play you're watching now he's talking about life but like by extension everything right it's all it all means nothing it's all baked into that it's i very think nihilist. That- it really is, yeah, and it's it's dark, and I can see why some people might not like it. But to me, it was like like you said this this idea of the insignificance of of us of people in general, and we do so much in our lives that seems so important, but ultimately it doesn't. It do, a lot of it doesn't matter, and um, even for Shakespeare, I know he didn't realize at the time how you know massively famous and popular his stuff would become. But this idea that what matters in life ultimately, like even this might not matter. I think, I don't think he's saying it doesn't matter. I'm saying it might not matter at the end of the day in the vastness of human experience. Like this, even this tale that you're watching is just, and some random dude who put sight and sound together and, and you know, it doesn't mean anything. Well, and he's also reacting to the death of his wife and he's, he's to me, he's broken here. This is a man who has lost all hope. Um, he's he's looking at life and going this all means nothing um but the implication could be that this is more of a sign of his current mental state than taken to be like the um opinion of shakespeare maybe he's just saying like this is how macbeth feels in this moment and it is pretty profound to think of it as this character whose main as far as we know main motivation is ambition for at the end of his life to realize like it was all for nothing. Yeah. And if only he had realized sooner. Well, and, and, and I think the, the, the other implication is he chose the wrong things, right? Like he thought being King was most important. And, in, and that was going to make him feel like he lived a fulfilling life. And he got that, but his wife commits suicide. He, his hands are permanently bloody. He can't wash the blood off of the things he's done. 
So in that sense, the things that actually matter, right, like having a happy family <laughs> and being in love and and not having your hands stained with guilt is is more important. Um, so, so, so he's sort of admitting that in a roundabout way. Yeah, I love that. I love that whole soliloquy. Um, it, it was, it's, it's, it, I, I love that shit. Um, I, one thing I did want to note. So so the wood coming to to uh, the castle and he the guy comes in and is like, the woods are coming closer. And he's like, no, they're not. You're fucking lying. And he's like, no, they are. And he's like, if you're lying, I'm going to kill you. But all of a sudden, he's like, he's probably telling the truth because those fucking witches said this was going to happen. And then yeah. sure enough, it is. They're carrying the, the, the tree boughs. This set off some like um, connective tissue in my head. And I was like, hmm. And sure enough, I read that um, the March of the Ents in Lord of the Rings is speculated to have been inspired by this moment in Macbeth. Which I believe pretty it. Pretty cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I definitely believe that. It's awesome. Yeah. It's just amazing I, when you start seeing the connective tissue of things and the idea that Tolkien was inspired by Shakespeare and, and this particular story. Um, okay, so yeah, then Macduff arrives at the head of this army, and there's a lot of fighting. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of battle. Uh, Mac, Macbeth, in in particular, kills this young Seward. Seward, I don't know how to say his name. Kills him in the in the, in the in the battlefield, and you know he, he comes up to him and he's like, "You're a foul foul villain, and I'm going to take you out." And Macbeth's like, "All right, try me," and kills the guy. <laughs> you know, um, he's like, "I can't be killed by you. You were born of a woman." So he's like, he believes he's invincible, and he's fighting like it, and apparently he's like quite powerful and deadly um and then we we get the further uh, meeting next where mc, mc uh, duff actually comes in, in, in to confront Macbeth on the battlefield and uh he's like you know you don't got a shot at this either man you were born by a woman and Macduff's like actually uh i was uh cut out of my mother you know prematurely or whatever so like c-section i guess mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that's like no <laughs> i never kind of foreseen this um and uh it, 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 but i like that the I, there's like an implication of like believing you're invincible is tantamount to being invincible and maybe it's the doubt that is actually what got, gets Macbeth here because maybe all of this was horseshit anyway i don't know yeah I like that. Yeah. I hadn't even thought of it like yeah, that. Yeah, I like that. It, it, yeah, the idea of like now all of a sudden he sees himself as vulnerable and he is now vulnerable in a way that it's he was perception. Before. Yeah. And anyway, uh, we they fight and uh, Macbeth, I think this happens off screen, but Macbeth dies. And then, yeah, Macduff later comes walking in. I think Macbeth's head is like on a pike or something. It's like, yep, he chopped his, his head, head off. Got it. Yeah, he's dead. Um, and, uh, you know, the kingship's going to move to Malcolm. And I guess that's a happy ending. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, this, this play was giving me like game of Thrones vibes a little bit. Like, you know, I, I can imagine uh, a lot of fantasy authors over the years have been influenced by, by Shakespeare. Um, it's very bloody. It's very kind of red wedding ish at times of the way, like people were, I don't know, uh, <laughs> betraying people, you know, wiping out entire families <laughs> like it was you know it's 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 yeah uh really dark play and uh ultimately i enjoyed it and you're and you're totally right like all this toxic masculinity stuff i think totally holds up lady Macbeth, um her transition from being ambitious and and, and power hungry to being guilt-ridden and uh eventually committing suicide is very dark um Really cool. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this, even if it was admittedly more of a uh, tall task to finally feel like I was getting the story fully. Um, but it was ultimately a rewarding experience that, uh, yeah, I'm glad I did. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think this sort of like, you know, continuing to learn, continuing to challenge ourselves. And this is a work that obviously people have been studying for centuries and will study for centuries, like to get to touch it in some way and then and then record a podcast about it and give our thoughts and like, you know, as as surface level as they might seem. <laughs> uh, I love the opportunity to do it because, you know, any excuse to, to tackle something like this, I just think 
gives us good context for our own work and, and oh absolutely in general yeah i could totally reference this now because i actually yeah. understand it <laughs> uh, but I, speaking of that let us know the ways in which we got it wrong uh <laughs> you know be gentle with us but yeah we welcome that you can email us or, or comment on uh the video or the or the or if there's a way to comment on the episode itself or, or add us on social media in case we didn't make this clear earlier we are going to be following this episode up with our coverage of the tragedy of Macbeth, uh, directed by Joel Cohen, I believe. Um, that's going to be our film. We're going to follow uh, follow this with and compare the two. Um, but that won't be coming out next week. Uh, we're taking the week off, uh, and uh, we will instead be releasing a From the Vault episode, which is going to be one of our former Patreon exclusive episodes from probably a couple years ago. We're going to put out into the main feed. Um, so if you missed that, you can listen to it there. Um, and then we'll be back with the tragedy of Macbeth. Yeah, and I can't wait to get to the tragedy of Macbeth. It looks amazing. Yes. I have been holding off watching it, and uh, I just can't wait to get to that. Uh, if you like this episode, please let us know in the form of a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening to this on. Wherever you're able to leave a review, please do, because it helps the show and uh, continues to get the word out there. Absolutely. And if you would like to support our podcast uh, monetarily, uh, thank you. We would love that. Uh, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash film. Um, you know, we have tons of bonus episodes on there. You're going to get a taste of one next, next week, but, uh, we, you know, we have a couple of years worth that, that are still on there exclusive and we release them monthly. Um, and, uh, we'd love to have you on there. We also have a bunch of merch and stuff that you can get at different tiers, a lot of different options. So just check it out. If you're at all curious, patreon.com slash ink to film and make sure to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at ink to film and join our discord, which I will post a link in our council of inklings on Facebook. Um, it's open to anyone now who knows the podcast and is interested, or you can just message us on any platform and we'll send you a link, um, get you in there. That's uh, We can have uh, more intimate conversations with our listeners on there and, and, and talk about the latest news and adaptations and all kinds of fun stuff like that. We'd love to have you. Thank you to Russ Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. Uh, all right, uh, that's going to be it for Macbeth, and we will be back with the film. Um, in the meantime, I think I'm going to go wash my hands. There's a damned spot that I can't get out. Mm-hmm. Um, and until next time, keep adapting. <laughs>